Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this second in a series of sessions being organized by ASLM and our partners to really look at the implications of the release of the new ISO standard, ISO 15189 2022. In our first of um, three, three sessions we're having now, and they're going to be more, so please look out for those notifications. In our first session, um, we had experts from ASLM and CLSI who really gave us an overview of what the changes are in the ISO standard versus the previous ISO standard, ISO 15189-2012. In this session, we're really going to look at what does it mean for the different sectors in laboratory medicine. What does it mean for stakeholders at the national level, um, stakeholders at the facility level, and even just at the regional level as well? What does it mean for all of us? And how can we prepare ourselves to adapt and revise and align our systems to the new ISO standard? To start off that, uh, that discussion, our first presentation is going to be given by Mr. Teferi McConan. Mr. Teferi is the QMS and SLIPTA program manager at ASLM, so there's no better person to really start off this discussion with us to talk about the transfer to the new ISO standard. What does it mean in practice? So, Teferi, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and uh, good evening, wherever you are. And as Beatrice indicated, uh, this is the second, second session of uh, this uh, webinar uh, program. And my topic would focus on the transition to the new ISO 15189 of the Ford's edition. And we are going to see what it would bring in practice and what does it mean when we are preparing and working to transit to the new standard. Uh, when ASLM started, uh, to engage in this pro uh, process, the ISO 15189 standard was in the second edition, which is the 2007 version. And then uh, we uh, moved to the uh, third edition. And the third edition has uh, as the main uh, change from the second edition. Uh, we had the improved layout. And again, we have also uh, more uh, subclauses added into the third edition, like ethics, uh, legal entity, uh, and the like have been added. But the, the most groundbreaking for the third edition was the addition of clause 5.9 on the release of result and 5.10 on laboratory information management. Uh, so these are the, the big uh, change for this version. And we have been using this uh, up to recently. And as we have also been using 15189, we have been also using ISO 22870 uh, for the point of care specific cases. And currently, uh, as of uh, December, uh, the first week of December 22, uh, the fourth edition has been published and circulated for public use. The, what does the, the uh, fourth edition uh, brought out the main change from the third edition. Uh, it has an alignment which is in line with the ISO IC 17 or 25 of the 2017 version. And again, it also accommodated uh, the requirement for a specific case of point of care uh, technology. And again, it also increased emphasis on risk management and patient care. With this uh, uh, change, the, the fourth edition has been uh, introduced for public use. And in terms of uh, the, the change, the main change is the layout of uh, the fourth edition, uh, which has now eight section, while the third had five section. And the, the addition of uh, these uh, uh, three more requirements. Initially, we had the management and the, the uh, technical requirement, but now we have got uh, three additional requirements that need to be addressed. And again, the structure and governance requirement is also one groundbreaking uh, addition to this uh, standard. And in terms of uh, the application of the new standard, uh, the ISO 15189 of the fourth uh, edition can be used in addition to the medical laboratory. It can be used in other healthcare services such as diagnostic imaging, respiratory therapy, uh, physiological science, uh, 
and blood bank and transfusion services. And the use of this new standard would help to create a kind of collaboration and interfacing between the medical laboratory and other healthcare services, which are indicated in the above case. And it also assists the exchange of information between the medical laboratory and the other healthcare services. And it would also help us to harmonize our methods and procedures. And I would like to illustrate this uh, with the tuberculosis case and the full tuberculosis diagnosis cascade. We've been using the laboratory procedure and X-ray as imaging. Now these two need to be interfaced and work in collaboration uh, and both can be accredited with the same standard. So this is one of the, the uh, advantage. And again, now we need to see how the transition can happen. The International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation, ILAC, had its General Assembly meeting back in November 2022, and they made the resolution. And the resolution was endorsed to allow a three-year implementation period from the date of publication of uh, this fourth edition. The, the fourth edition was released in the first week of December 2022. So technically we would have uh, to complete the transition by December 2025. This would give laboratories uh, nearly three years to comply with the new standard. In terms of where we can get the new standard, like any other ISO document, ISO 15189 standard is under copyright protection. So each laboratory seeking accreditation I uh, must have a copy of uh, this standard as a soft copy or a hard copy. And the copy can come with the name of the laboratory or the person who processes the uh, purchasing of this standard. And laboratories are not allowed or they cannot share the copy with other facilities as it is copyright protected. And the Current price is nearly 200 USD per copy, and this is just approximate price because of the market fluctuation. And to obtain this copy, uh, you can go uh, to the ISO online store uh, at the provided link here. And then when you go to the link, it will give you this window where you can uh, select the format of the copy that you'd like to have. And again, the language. Currently, ISO uh, made the fourth edition available in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. And the price, uh, as indicated here, uh, is 187 uh, Swiss franc. We can also get this standard from other institutions, like the National Bureau of Standard in various countries that have adopted the ISO standard uh, and branded with their system. And again, we can go to the, the uh, Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute, which is CLSI, and the American National Standard. Standard Institute and other standard agencies like in Europe and Asia uh, region. What should laboratory facilities do to um, go through this transition period? Uh, there are two cases. One is where we have accredited laboratories and there are laboratories which would apply for the first time. So let's go for the already accredited facilities. They are expected to conduct a gap analysis to assess whether their current system is in line with the, the this uh, new standard. Their policy, processes, procedure, and the overall management system need to be assessed and come up with the, the gap that they can uh, fulfill uh, during the transition. And this can be done as part of the internal audit process by the facility people, uh, and preferably by the quality manager or the internal auditors in the facility. And there are new areas that need to be addressed in the following areas. Even though we have them in the previous uh, standard, we still have more uh, subclauses added for the risk assessment and patient care. Risk assessment and patient care would be addressed as, across the board in the three phases, EQA, the customer feedback, process control, and equipment are some of the areas that need attention. And once the gap can be identified by the lab, then they need to uh, soon develop action plan in line with the current version. 
And this can be done by the quality and the laboratory manager, and they can lead the process. They can coordinate their staff uh, to come up with this uh, gap analysis and action plan development. The plan would include a training of laboratory staff on the new standard, uh, giving emphasis on the risk assessment and patient care. And this can be accessed at ASLA, MCLSI, and other institutions which can provide training to professionals. And we need to revise quality document that to align to the new requirement. And we have to train our people in the lab with the uh, revised document. And the, the authority in the laboratory need to authorize and adapt the, doc the document with clear effective data so that everybody in the lab would follow uh, uh, and implement the, the process and the procedures. And this uh, process can be monitored uh, as part of the implementation through the continuous quality improvement process in the laboratory. And it would help them to continually improve up, up until they feel that they have accommodated everything in place. And then the laboratory need to lease with the accrediting body for the reassessment. Probably this process may take at least a 12 month period, but somehow they need to accelerate the, the implementation and the revision process. For laboratories which are preparing to get accreditation for the first time, uh, they need to designate a focal person who need to lead the process. And preferably this is the quality manager and the laboratory director. They need to form accreditation committee or task force who can work with them. And management and the staff need to be trained on the new standard. Uh, this may take some time up until they get the, the right and the revised uh, training materials. And the review and the revision uh, of the existing quality document need to be done also. Even though they would be applying for the first time, they may have started the process a year or some time back. So they need to evaluate uh, their existing uh, document and identify the gap that need to be improved in line with the fourth edition. And the other uh, material that would be used in the laboratory need to be uh, checked and they need to ensure that materials like SLAMTA, SLIPTA, LKSI and other uh, tools are in line with the new ISO standard. And laboratories can connect uh, with WHO, ASLM, USCDC and other agencies to get the updated version of uh, this package. And they need to establish a system also that can help them to manage risk and opportunities for improvement and laboratory uh, manager uh, need uh, to designate responsibilities across the board, which means that uh, since this is required in the three phases of the laboratory, uh, the, everybody who is practicing in the pre-examination, examination and post-examination phases need to be designated to check and manage the risk. <clears throat> Uh, for laboratories preparing for the first time, the, again, they need to identify and select an accreditation body uh, because this is going to be their first engagement. And the selection can be based on geographical uh, uh, regime or based on their language preference. And again, those accrediting bodies need to be uh, practicing in accordance to the ISO IC 17 or 11. And the list of accrediting uh, body can be available at AFRAC and ILA uh, with the provided link. Anybody can uh, go through one of uh, the link and select a list of uh, accrediting body. And again, the other factor that we need to consider uh, during the selection is the price uh, and the Based on the selection, then the laboratory now need to prepare itself and plan for the first assessment. And with this, they can move toward this accreditation. And what about the Ministry of Health? What are they expected to do uh, during this transitional period? The Ministry of Health uh, need to communicate to the national and regional accrediting body to identify any potential changes in transition plan that can be uh, provided by these bodies. And they need to incorporate the requirement of uh, ISO 15189 into relevant laboratory documents, which is found at the Ministry of health hand, uh, such as like the national laboratory policy, the national laboratory strategic plan, and national laboratory quality manual template, and, and other documents need to be checked 
uh, and updated. Uh, and we don't need to forget that this uh, process, the, the inclusion of uh, the point of care uh, guidance that has been used in the clinical department. And this can be done by the director of laboratory service at the Ministry of Health, and it can be supported by the National Laboratory Technical Working Group. So countries need to establish technical working group, which, which can support the laboratory directory to go through this process. And the Ministry of Health, again, need to enforce adoption of change by all stakeholders. The ministry need to communicate with the National Bureau of Standard and Licensing Office in the country to revise and update their national standard guideline and regulations in line with the uh, fourth edition. And they need to communicate also professional councils, a professional society and associations to revise all their materials and the clinical care stakeholders uh, within the healthcare system. Uh, they also need to consider the inclusion of uh, point of care into the fourth edition of ISO 15189. And manufacturers uh, uh, are also working closely with the laboratories and the ministries, especially in terms of uh, placing equipment or lasing equipment to facilities. And again, they would be also involved in the uh, equipment maintenance, calibration and the repair. So for this case, they need to be considered as one potential stakeholder in the country. And they need to be also communicated uh, for their revision and aligning their system uh, with the fourth edition. And this can be done through the MOH mandated oversight and follow up process. And they need to ensure and enforce the transition as fast as possible. And the Ministry of Affairs need also uh, to consider training of laboratory staff, mentors, and assessors using the, the ISO 15189 of the 2022 version. And again, the Ministry of Affairs need to revisit the mentorship program for effective and efficient technical assistance support. This can uh, preferably done by the National Technical Working Group, which can coordinate the, the national and international uh, implementing partners and uh, agencies who are practicing in that country. What about in terms of uh, personnel level? Uh, what do quality in charge uh, people uh, are going to do during this transition? like the quality uh, management system assessors and uh, auditors, they should seek uh, for training as soon as possible. And this could be achieved through a package of uh, the package that can be offered by accrediting body. Uh, the, so far, we don't know the price, but they can reach out to the accrediting body and identify which would be the best for them in terms of uh, the, the price and the others. And online training as part of continuing education can also be provided by ASLM, CLSI and other institutions. And this can be also tapped as one uh, potential uh, opportunity for training of auditors and assessors. Currently, CLSI has uh, allocated 15 CPD points uh, for this uh, training program. And competency of all assessors will have to be reassessed by an independent third party. And uh, then we can uh, understand how competent they would be with the new version of the standard so that they can uh, facilitate uh, the, the transition process. So uh, with this, I'll uh, wind up my presentation uh, and uh, would allow the next speaker to take us deep into the, the ISO 15189 uh, change and the impact that we can have on them. So thank you. Back to you, Beatrice. Thank you, Teferi, for that very informative presentation. Um, I hope you can all see that for us in the laboratory sector, there is a lot to consider um, in terms of how we move forward practically to align with this new standard. So without much further ado, let me move to our second presentation. As um, Teferi said, we, Professor Kilian Songwe from of the AG Group is going to be giving us a presentation that looks at really deep diving into the impact for the lab of this new standard. At the laboratory level, what do we need to do? Teferi touched on what other stakeholders need to do, the MOH, our manufacturers, our equipment vendors, the other people that we work with, auditors. 
But Professor Songwe's um, presentation is going to really look at how do we as laboratory facilities start to look and align our system to ISO 15189. So Professor Songwe, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Beatrice, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody who is on here with us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to join uh, colleagues from all over the world for these sessions. And uh, indeed, this is our second session, and uh, we can just see the volumes uh, uh, as uh, Beatrice continues to mention for people to uh, get together to watch. It shows how high the interest is, and so we're very glad to have you all. And uh, basically, I would take my presentation actually through two phases. Uh, the first phase will just talk about some terms uh, that are in the fourth edition and some changes to the definitions. And then the second phase will look at some gap analyses and the actual trans transition plan for, for moving into uh, the fourth edition. So uh, facility level implications uh, of having the fourth edition. Uh, what we have here in terms of just looking at the standard very briefly and quickly, there has been a quick shift from uh, 27 terms in the third edition to 32 in this edition, but then some uh, complete removal, some changes in definitions, as well as the extent of the changes being defined as minor or major. And just to look at that, uh, I have a, at least three examples which I want to take you through. Uh, the first one, it says competence. And in the third edition, it defines it as demonstrated ability to apply knowledge and skills. And the fourth edition actually looks specifically to achieve the intended results in the 22, 2022 version. And the extent of that change is minor. Then terms that we're used to, uh, laboratory management, for example, uh, personal persons who direct the management, uh, direct and manage the activities of the laboratory versus person or persons with responsibility for and authority over. Uh, that's language that uh, had been used, but now it's actually inserted in the fourth edition. And that's a major change because it actually succinctly looks at responsibilities. And then quality indicator, uh, very uh, minor change here. It talks about measure of the degree to which a set of inherent characteristics. And then in the fourth edition, it talks about measure of the degree to which a number of characteristics of an object fulfills requirement. So this uh, basically just introduces, so as we go through the standard, we need to pay attention to uh, uh, some of the, the way the language is actually presented and what it actually means for our different facilities. Again, this has been shown, I think this was shown in our very first presentation, uh, new terms to, uh, the, the standard, uh, 50 new terms were, were added. And then uh, 10 uh, words that we've used very much uh, in the past accreditation process, quality management system or quality policy that have been removed from the fourth edition. So going forward, uh, we're looking at here, we says the inclusion of point of care, which uh, Teferi already mentioned, thanks indeed Teferi, and uh, the importance of risk management in the standard. Uh, Teferi already mentioned the alignment to uh, ISO 17025, so I wouldn't dwell on that much longer. Then there is, of course, uh, the new edition. Uh, it's always, when we're dealing with standards, it's always to be recognized that all the standards actually reflect a minimum requirement. And therefore, as uh, laboratorians and people in practice, uh, we are expected uh, to seek the best that we can, not just to uh, stick to the minimum requirement. Uh, the fourth edition in this case, again, it's very heavy on uh, patient focus. Uh, there's a big shift uh, this time from preventive action uh, to risk and opportunities. So our famous uh, CAPA uh, is now gone through the windows and we now have CARO in, uh, record retention based on the risk. And the EQA in this particular uh, fourth edition actually moved from being a note in the third edition uh, into being a full requirement in this edition. And just to touch on the uh, EQA, since I mentioned it, it says, when selecting EQA programs, the laboratory should consider the type of target value offered. And when you look at what happened in the third edition, it was actually a note, and it spoke more to the essence of materials and that were used. However, the fourth edition, and this is a point when we talk about the transition, our, our labs have to be very careful about, because it talks about independently, 
set by a reference method versus the other three uh, uh, values, which say set by overall consensus uh, data or set by method peer group consensus data or set by a panel of experts. So there, there is a variation here, uh, which we need to take into deep consideration uh, when we do this. So moving on to, this is where uh, the, uh, there is much interest, uh, actually talking about doing the gap analysis and the transition plan. And uh, Teferi already mentioned a number of things here, but let's look uh, specifically at what is going on. Uh, already it has been mentioned that there's a three year window for all laboratories that are currently accredited to actually fully transition into the fourth edition. It says here, submission of a transition plan uh, along with a demonstrated a demonstration on how the transition is going to be effected is going to be a requirement. Effective implementation will be assessed at the site during the actual assessment, if it's a first time assessment or it's a surveillance assessment. So what should actually happen for accredited labs? The first two things is review the, uh, the revised standard. So get, you have to purchase the, the fourth edition. You really need to own the, the, a copy of it. Uh, do a gap analysis against your system, establish a transition plan, and then document the gap analysis and the transition plan. So those are four key steps that actually allows you to start the motion moving into having a proper fourth, uh, pro a proper standard. In terms of what would happen post uh, establishing your gap analysis and a transition plan, of course, there is going to be an assessment and the assessing body uh, is going to come in, uh, look at the system. If you completely do not conform, uh, there's just in the initial case, there is a six month suspension. And unfortunately, if the six months elapse and you still do not conform, then there is a complete withdrawal of your accreditation. In this case, to the ISO, uh, the third edition, the 2012 edition. For new applicants, and may I please just take the uh, a few seconds to say, when we're dealing with these laboratories, we are talking about laboratories as laboratories. It really doesn't matter whether you're a public uh, facility or you're in the private sector. All the laboratories have to comply if they voluntarily decide to go into accreditation. Again, all new applications. So if you've never been accredited before or you want to extend the scope uh, of your accreditation, you shall be assessed against the fourth edition 5189-2022. But now this is going to vary from different bodies because uh, if you take SANAS, for example, SANAS, uh, the application for the 2012 edition has already expired. And so we've now moved into the 2022 edition. Just as a point of emphasis, because uh, Teferi mentioned this and I'm mentioning it again as a true point of emphasis, uh, the 2012 edition is going to cease to become valid as of December 6, 2025. So let's talk about the transition, the gap analysis. In doing the gap analysis, you basically need to come up with a very uh, simple template, uh, uh, the name of your laboratory organization. Uh, if you're already accredited, then you would have an accreditation number or a code and the date for your submission. And basically we want to be able to identify all the clauses of the third edition, the clauses of the fourth edition and the extent of the change. The last column actually looks at you explaining in detail how you are going to address the changes, your management system changes, and how what actions you are going to take to come into compliance. So talking about the extent of the uh, change, the, there is a key here that talks about structural uh, change. Requirements remain the same, but it is under a new uh, clause number. It could be a minor change. Wording of the requirement has changed, but the overall intent is consistent. It could be a major change. Changes will require that the certifying uh, body uh, the, to implement new changes to the existing practice. And it could actually be a new change completely, new requirements concept, not in the previous version, in this case, the third edition. So in terms of a template, this is what we're going to need to develop as laboratories. So I'm throwing in here a couple of examples to be able to allow us to go through. So, Doing the gap analysis, 
If we took, for example, uh, clause 4.1.1.1 in the third edition, it says general. In the new edition, it says uh, the clause is 5.3.2, and it, call, it says laboratory activities, conformance with requirements. And the extent of that change is actually structural. And in terms of what you're going to do, there is really nothing in this case uh, because the requirements are basically the same. I give an example of uh, the extent where it's new. And uh, now this is a clause where the extent is major. So in the third edition, uh, 4.9 says identification and control of non-conformities. In the fourth edition, 7.5, it says non-conforming work. The extent of that change is major. And this is uh, an example which I wrote in to be able to help you understand what the requirements will be looking at. It says the SOP for handling non-conformities and whatever the nomenclature is in your system is revised to add utilization of risk analysis uh, to define immediate actions, determining the need to recall, release, recall and release results and review the non-conformities. In addition to immediate action, long-term actions are to be implemented where applicable according to the added section in your standard operating procedure. And then there is reference made to that uh, operating procedure. So there needs to be a detailed explanation of what you're going to do, what documents are going to be affected and to what extent they're going to be looked at or dealt with. Because when the accrediting bodies come, they are going to want to see how you've actually implemented this. Another example that I look at is uh, in the third edition of clause 5.4.3, it says request uh, form for information in the new standard, the fourth edition, uh, 7.2.3, pre-examination processes, request for providing laboratory examination. The extent is major because there is a real big change. And here uh, we give an example, or I give an example at least, of talking about where would all of this information be found? Most of our laboratories are very familiar with the clinician's handbook. Uh, and in the clinician's handbook, there's going to be a lot of information that could tell us how to exactly fill the requisition form, uh, the different requesters, including the clinicians. And we have to address how we're going to manage filling the a request form in two events. Event number one, where we have an LIS system, and event number two, when the LIS system is down and we have to use uh, paper-based systems. That has to be very properly addressed so that that communication is understood, it is appreciated, and our laboratories can actually implement them, and the requesters can actually follow the instructions as guided. Again, uh, when your accrediting body comes, whichever one you select, uh, they're going to actually be looking at the implementation of the changes that you have stated in your gap analysis as to how you've actually implemented them. Moving on to the transition plan, uh, I actually just picked up uh, 7.5. In the transition plan, there are literally three columns to the transition plan. There is an action column, there is a period column, in this case time, and then there is a responsible person. So in this case, we're talking about managing uh, the non-conformities and aligning the non-conformities uh, into the new standard, uh, the new edition, 7.5. And we are going to say, it's for, for the purpose of this discussion, we say it's one month. So we assume that you've already bought a standard. We assume that you've already uh, done a review of the standard uh, against your system. So we say we're going to start on March the 1st, 2023. And we have one month through March 31st to be able to develop the documents uh, needed to handle non-conformities in our system. And the responsible person for that is going to be uh, the lab manager. Again, uh, the responsible person is actually going to be very dependent on the complexities of your lab. If you're running a small lab, uh, uh, the lab manager might actually also be the chemistry supervisor. If you're running a big lab, uh, you might be able to have the luxury to a quality officer. You might have the luxury to a lab manager. So the complexity of your laboratory would determine the responsible persons who would be, uh, be responsible for following up on the different actions. So talking about the different actions, uh, again, uh, there has to be a review. A gap analysis must be done. 
establish the transition plan, which we've just looked at, document very carefully the gap analysis and the transition plan. And I drop a gun chart behind this just to be able to help laboratories because this is going to be overwhelming. Uh, three years sounds like a lot of time, but uh, my dear colleagues, we are already in February of 2023 and we are talking about December of 2025. So if you develop a gun chart and uh, you start putting some things on it, I think that would help you to be able to see how to move through this a little bit faster. Uh, talking about uh, transition uh, deadlines, uh, we have a couple of uh, accrediting bodies that have already announced. There is SANAS, uh, whose date already passed as January 31. Uh, there is KENAS, which is looking at uh, September 30th, SATCAS June 14, UCAS uh, June 30th, and uh, NABL of India. And then we have a bunch of them, uh, Egypt, uh, Tunac, Algeria, that have not yet uh, announced. So to conclude, uh, key to success, Contact your accrediting body uh, today. Uh, Teferi already mentioned. Uh, start your transition now. Effectively communicate to all level relevant parties. Uh, involvement of everyone is key. Uh, management should continue to show commitment as they do state in their uh, policy documents. And embrace risk and opportunities for improvement. I think that's the great movement of this particular edition. And uh, people with great passion, can make the impossible happen. Uh, this is a slide we borrowed out of Africa, CDC, uh, COVID-19 uh, genome sequencing. Acknowledgement goes to Africa, CDC, uh, ASLM for having us on their webinar platform, Kenas and Sanas, Yukas and uh, Sonic Healthcare. Thank you, merci, obrigado. Over, Beatrice. Thank you very much, um, Professor Killian. So again, um, for those of you from the laboratory facilities on this call, there is a lot to do and we need to get started or we needed to get started yesterday. So I hope um, after Professor Killian's presentation, you will be in your labs first thing on Monday, putting together your transition plan. So let's move forward with the questions. And just to emphasize again, to those who are asking, Please, we will be sharing the presentations and the recording of the session. Also, when you registered for this um, session, your email was captured. So you do not need to put your email and your, your details in the chat box. It is captured. And so you will definitely get a link to the recording and to the presentations as well. If you have a question, continue to put that question or comment in the chat box and we will be happy to address it. But let's start with the questions that we have. Um, so I will address this question to um, Teferi. Teferi, I have a question which says that considering the number of participants interested in this standard, could ASLM approach ISO to negotiate a reduced cost for those ASLM members from low income countries? So Teferi, can we do that? Okay, thank you, Beatrice. Uh, we have already uh, approached ISO and ISO redirected our request to the National uh, Standard uh, Institute in various country. And currently uh, we are discussing with the National Standard Institute in Addis Ababa where ASLM is also uh, co-located. And as soon as they finalize their branding and uh, adaptation, uh, we may get uh, a copy that can be distributed for training purpose. Thank you, Teferi. And I would like to re-emphasize that as well. Um, it, your, a lot of our countries have adopted ISO 15189 through your standards body, even if you do not have like a, a national quality program necessarily, please check with your standards agency. Um, you, you're more likely to get a copy of the standard from there. Okay, the next question then, um, I think will, I'll address to Professor um, Songwe, please. The question is, how long should it take a country laboratory to, to transition to the, to the standards? So you talked about three years, and you also talked about the fact that we need to start this process now. Any further advice on, on, on this transition period um, that you can offer so that we can make sure we're prepared for what's coming? Uh, thank you, uh, Beatrice. Uh, that's a question we've actually started dealing with in-house. Uh, and just for starters, at least 12 months is going to be the basic minimum. Uh, first of all, they need to actually obtain the standard. 
go through the standard uh, clause by clause and actually see what they have in their system and put it on their gap analysis template so that they can clearly see what they already have because some things might already be addressed in their system depending on the complexity of the system uh, but might just not be under the appropriate clause nomenclature so they just need to go carefully through the new edition and against what they already have the sops they have the manuals they have and uh, do that uh, gap analysis once they do that uh, in terms of going through the transition plan, that could happen very quickly. I would say another quarter, you could go through the transition plan in terms of determining who the responsible person is, having an action. I think the key thing about the transition plan is not just stating the transition plan. You would have to actually have executed some kind of implementation so that at the point of an assessment, you would be able to show your accrediting body or your assessing body that you have actually implemented your changes and you've not found any non-conformities or any uh, risk uh, that have come up, but then you have to show some opportunities that have actually arisen from the implementation of uh, the new standard. So I would say uh, if you started today, anything between the next nine to 12 months will be good timing. Thank you, over. Um, and Prof, whilst you're here, um, I'll, perhaps you can take another question for us. So we had a question which was asking about the clauses. So you stated that if a lab is already accredited um, and there is a deadline for you have to transition your new system if you're accredited to 2012 and that you perform a gap analysis to look at those clauses that uh, where you are non-compliant with to the new standard and to work on that. The question is asking, does that mean that we just look at those areas in our system which are currently non-compliant if we're requesting for re-assessment um, or do we address all our system? So in essence, you have to address everything that is non-compliant. Again, uh, that if, you, or if you, you, there are certain clauses in your system that are already uh, compliant, then you don't need to do anything about them. Interestingly enough, uh, the way the fourth edition is structured, there is a lot of movement of uh, some of the sub clauses. So while uh, there might be nothing you have to do with it, you just need to make sure that the new sub clause is properly aligned into the new uh, into the new edition. So you might just need to move it over. Now, in the event where when you move it over, you have to ensure that your document that information is actually following in sequence. So you don't have a nomenclature that is referring you to uh, uh, what used to be clause four, uh, management requirements. And then now it has moved over to uh, clause five in the new edition, but your nomenclature is actually uh, pointing to something else. So that's where the pain actually comes in, is ensuring that even when you are not making changes, the nomenclature of your documents and the presentation actually aligns to the new standard. Because if it doesn't align, then it becomes very difficult to say that you're practicing when you're out of alignment. One more question, um, Prof. Um, there's a question which is seeking clarification. What is the meaning of the deadline of January, 2023, and yet the transition is three years? So you mentioned in your presentation that there's a deadline of, um, um, January 2023, but you also mentioned that there's a three-year transition period. What does that mean? So on the uh, transition dates, uh, different uh, accrediting bodies have, have different dates for you to completely, for you to apply for uh, the new standard. So for example, uh, SANAS, I think uh, that's the one that is referred to in that. Uh, the SANAS uh, application date was January 31st, 2023, which is a few days ago, about eight, nine days ago. And so anybody who is going to apply to SANAS uh, as a first time, uh, a new applicant would have to apply under the new, the fourth edition, they would have to apply under that standard. But now if you're already accredited and you're applying to SANAS, then you're going to first of all have to build your gap analysis, build your transition plan, submit it at minimum of one month for it to be reviewed, and then you would have a date. And now in that process, that's where the three year application comes in. So you would have three years to go back and forth with your accrediting body to finally be completely uh, transitioned to the fourth edition. But if you're a new applicant, 
For Sanas, for example, it would have been January 31st. For Kenas, I think it's uh, September. So you just need to speak to your different uh, suggested accrediting bodies to see when you need to, as a new applicant, use the new standard. But as an old applicant, the, the dates are going to differ and they go as far down as January 1st, 2024, for you to actually apply to the fourth edition. Thank you very much, Prof. Zongwe. Um, So Teferi, please, um, back to you. There is a, que the, a question relating to the SLIPTA um, program and the SLIPTA checklist. It says, is, SLIPTA, is the SLIPTA checklist going to be updated? Yes, definitely. It is going to be updated uh, as per the, the new standard. And we have already started the process and uh, probably we may engage some of our ASLM certified uh, SLIPTA auditors and other stakeholders on the ground to give us feedback during the revision process. Thank you. And then another question is talking about the standards body and access to the standard at the country level. Can a standard board by a country be used across the laboratories in the same country and considered valid? So if a country hasn't necessarily adopted the standard, but through um, certain agencies, the Ministry of Health, et cetera, um, an institution buys a copy of the standard, can that um, standard be then shared with other labs in the system for use? Uh, basically, uh, uh, since the ISO standard uh, are under copyright protection, ISO would give you a case by case uh, permission. Uh, and so far, uh, we have been uh, procuring the standard for training purpose. But for laboratories which are going to implement and use this as external source of information, and uh, they need to have their own specific copy under their name. Uh, and uh, if there are any uh, uh, implementing partner or any agency working in some country, which may support, let's say, uh, 10, 20 or 100 laboratory, they may uh, have arrangement and agreement with that specific staff and that office, uh, if it can be used beyond the training purpose, if it can be used to update and align their system uh, in the facilities. Uh, and this need to be taken as case by case with the agencies that would sell the standard to the Minister of Health or to any interested implementing partner in a given country. And uh, Beatrice, I would like to add also uh, on, uh, on one of the questions that has been well addressed by Professor uh, Kilian, of course. Uh, when we talk about uh, the aligning or uh, doing some kind of uh, gap assessment, uh, uh, to align our system into the fourth edition, it doesn't mean only taking one point or one clause into the system. Everything uh, in our uh, process, uh, be it the pre-examination, examination, and post-examination, and again, the 12 quality system essentials need to be covered, and it should be checked point by point, and make sure that the, the, their existing system the policy, the procedure, and the process that they have in place is in line with the current version, the current requirement, which otherwise it would be outdated. And they need to pay a special attention in this case. Thank Back you. To you. Um, Teferi, um, also, the, this question keeps coming back about the inclusion of POCT into the new standard. And as you know, different agencies different before this there was there was there was a separate standard relating to this so moving forward how do we deal with a very delicate issue of now incorporation of the POCT into the, the whole diagnostic spectrum and that's the you know the that coming under the clinical lab how what is the what are the steps countries institutions can take to ensure that there is a smooth transition um, to that new um, working model no, thank you, Beatrice. Yes, this needs to be handled uh, preferably by the laboratory directorate at the Ministry of Health in those countries. Or uh, if it is uh, in institutions like EPHI in Ethiopia, NHLS in South Africa, and other institutions in various countries, uh, they need to take the leadership 
uh, in terms of accommodating the existing guideline that they have for point of care technology, and it should be incorporated into uh, this one. Now, when they are going to uh, claim or request for accreditation or reassessment of those point of care uh, section, uh, they need to uh, see how it can be collaborated with the, the, the main laboratory within the same premises, premises, or they need to indicate how they are going to collaborate and again harmonize their procedure and processes so that they can be uh, captured within the new version. Uh, so far, we th there was uh, uh, issue or a gray zone in terms of point of care, especially when it comes to the quality uh, test result that can be provided by the point of care versus the conventional laboratory, the EQA program, competency of personnel. There's were a huge gap in the point of care section. And now the, all this issue uh, would be addressed because this standard would help to collaborate between the point of care and, and the main laboratory section within the, the, the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let me call you for one more question before I leave you to let rest. There's yes. a lot of yes. interest. Yes. For those labs who are not accredited but have undergone the SLIPTA process and are currently have SLIPTA certification to uh, the, the SLIPTA, the 2015 checklist, SLIPTA checklist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the process? We've already talked about um, activities currently undergoing to revise the SLIPTA checklist to 2022, something we hope to finish um, by the by mid by mid year. So a fast transition. But for those who, labs who have certification to SLIPTA 2015, what do they need to do? Um, are there any processes um, similar to what the accrediting bodies are doing to kind of look at reassessment and recertification under SLIPTA? Uh, thank you, Beatrice. Yes, uh, SLIPTA is uh, a framework that would take laboratories to our disaccreditation, which means that these laboratories, which has been assessed by ASLM using the current checklist, which is version uh, 2, uh, up until it can be revised, uh, what we would advise laboratories are to go with the gap analysis and the transition uh, program as fast as possible, like those laboratories which would go for uh, accreditation. They need to prepare and align their system, their policies, processes, and procedures. And at ASLM, we have already started the discussion with WHO Afro and the other stakeholders to revise the checklist. Uh, uh, and taking a lesson from our previous experience, uh, because in the third edition, uh, when the third edition was published in 2012, we were able to uh, update our checklist in 2015. But now we are accelerating the process to update the checklist and be uh, a catalyst in this transition process. So that would also need to be noted by the facilities and they need to be uh, quickly starting the transition as fast as possible. Thank you, Teferi. So let me give uh, you a break and then just maybe um, answer a couple of questions which have come up. Um, there was a, is there, there was a question here about what tests should you select? If you are looking at selecting tests for accreditation, what tests should you select to move forward for accreditation and which is easier? Um, the response to that is, nothing is easy when you want to seek accreditation. And so for a lab, you have to look at, um, you can get accredited for the entire scope of what you do, or you can get accredited for one test or one scope of work. It is up to you. What is the re the capacity that you have in terms of the resources, in terms of the support, the skill to be able to do that? Um, obviously, we encourage that where you do have the capacity that the whole your whole scope of testing is covered, but we do recognize that with resource challenges, in some labs we have to take it step by step. Um, so you have to make that decision for yourself. Um, you know, it is not up to ISO or us to make that decision for you. There is also questions regarding the checklist for the accrediting bodies. Um, and for that, yes, of course, the, the accrediting bodies would have to update their checklist accordingly and release that. So you, um, if we have any information regarding that, we can share it um, in due course from the um, next session. But please also check with your accrediting bodies um, website just to get further information about that. 
Um, we have three minutes left, and so we're nearing the end of this session. And we would like to acknowledge the interest, the questions, and the comments that we have had um, coming through today. Um, we can, we, if there's anything, any question, any comment that hasn't been addressed, please, we will. Um, we have our different forums, and we will share some answers to those questions that we were not able to cover during this session. Um, but I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the LabCorp um, National Biology Reference Laboratory team who were watching this session together. Um, as you can see, it, it, we have 978 people online, but there are much more in your different institutions and in your different locations who are watching this session. We thank you for your interest. Please, there's going to be another session in two weeks time where we're going to look at the implications for our different training toolkits and checklists that we use. So please look out for the notification for those sessions. Um, also on screen, you can see that a poll has been um, deployed to look at um, how you found the session. Please respond accordingly because we use this to also look at what topics and subjects you're interested in so that we can plan our sessions accordingly. Um, with that said, I would like to again emphasize that we will also be sharing um, the recordings and the presentations with everyone. And we look forward to engaging with you on the next session. So thank you very much everybody for your presence and your participation this afternoon. Thank you to our speakers, Mr. Teferi McConing and, and Professor Killian Songwe. And we look forward to meeting with you all at the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much.